Escarpment Blues by Sarah Harmer here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Health care reform may be stalled in Congress, but we turn now to an issue that rarely comes up in discussions about improving our health care system, the relationship between emotional stress and disease, between mental and physical health more broadly, is often considered controversial within medical orthodoxy. But my next guest argues not all aspects of illness can be reduced to facts verified by the strictest scientific techniques. The Vancouver-based Dr. Gabor Mate argues too many doctors seem to have forgotten what was once a commonplace assumption, that emotions are deeply implicated in both the development of illness and in the restoration of health. Based on medical studies and his own experience with chronically ill patients at the palliative care unit at Vancouver Hospital, where he was the medical coordinator for seven years, Dr. Gabor Mate makes the case there are important links between the mind and the immune system. He finds stress and individual emotional makeup play critical roles in an array of diseases, including cancer, heart disease, diabetes, irritable bowel syndrome, multiple sclerosis and arthritis. Dr. Mate is a best-selling author of four books in Canada, including When the Body Says No, Understanding the Stress-Disease Connection. His latest book is in the realm of hungry ghosts, close encounters with addiction. Uh, we spoke with him about that book a few weeks ago on Democracy Now. Today we explore the costs of hidden stress. Dr. Gabor Mate joining us today from Vancouver, Canada. Welcome to Democracy Now, Dr. Mate. Um, let's talk about this connection between stress, the mind-body connection. You know, the traditional medicines of China for 3,000 years, the Ayurvedic medicine of India, and the tribal shamanic medicines of all cultures around the world have always taken for granted that mind and body can't be separated. Now, Western medicine has cleaved the two apart for really th uh, 2,000 years. Uh, Socrates already uh, criticized the doctors of his day for separating the mind from the body. and. The irony, in fact, the tragedy is that now we have the Western science that shows incontrovertibly and in great detail that mind and body can't be separated. And so that any attempt to do so leaves the medical practitioner short of many tools to help clients. And of course, it leaves patients short of what they need for their own healing. Uh, healing. The, the point now is, is that the emotional centers of the brain which regulate our behaviors and our responses and our reactions are physiologically connected with, and we know exactly how they're connected with the immune system, the nervous system, and the hormonal apparatus. In fact, it's no longer possible uh, scientifically to speak of these as separate systems, as if immunity was separate from emotions, as if the nervous system was separate from the hormonal apparatus. There's one system and they're wired together by the nervous system itself and joined together by chemical messengers that they all secrete. And so that whatever happens emotionally has an impact immunologically and vice versa. So for example, we know now that the white cells in the circulation of, our, of the blood can manufacture every hormone that the brain can manufacture and vice versa. So that the brain and the immune system are always talking to another. So in short, we have one system. The science that studies it is, is called psychoneuroimmunology. And scientifically, it's not even controversial, but it's completely lacking for medical practice. What do you mean, Dr. Mate, by the mind body, by the Bermuda Triangle? Oh, well, the Bermuda Triangle is, is that the research is done. For example, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, three years ago, or four years ago, a study presented at the Heart and Stroke Foundation's International Congress on Women's Health, a study that was written up in the online version of a major North American medical journal called Circulation, showed that women, over a 10-year period, that followed 1,700 women, over a 10-year period, women who were unhappily married and didn't express their emotions were four times as likely to die as those women who were unhappily married and did express their feelings. In other words, the non-expression of emotion was associated with a 400% increase in the death rate. And this study was done in the States, part of a major population study. Now, you'd think that study would send every physician in North America trying to figure out the mind-body connection. But these studies get published and they sink without a trace. There was a study two years ago that showed that uh, children of mothers who are stressed and depressed are themselves, the children are more likely to have asthma. Again, the mind-body connection. You think that study alone 
we would send every physician running to figure out the mind-body connection. But again, these studies are done, they disappear without a trace, and they have no impact on medical practice. And that's what I mean by the Bermuda Triangle, is that we have the research, we just don't pay attention to it. It's like if it never happened. You talk about emotions like anger, sharing with our immune system the same role of defending our boundaries, saying when we repress emotions, we may also repress our immune defenses. How does that play out in various diseases? Well, when I looked at the kind of people that would be coming under my care in palliative care, but also the kind of people who would get sick when I was in family practice, a number of salient characteristics presented themselves. One was the repression of anger. People didn't know how to express negative emotion. They were afraid to do so or didn't know when they were angry. People were pleasers. They tried to always not to disappoint other people. They never knew how to say no. They took on everything without a murmur because they saw their role as, as always being the caregivers and the caretakers. And um, they uh, had an exceedingly powerful sense of duty, role, and responsibility. Now, if you look at uh, the role of healthy assertion of boundaries and anger, for example, it's actually there to protect you. I'm talking about healthy anger. It's not there to attack anybody, it's just there to protect your boundaries. That's the same role as the immune system have. The immune system also functions like a brain. It has memory, it has reactive capacity, and it has learning capacity. In fact, the immune system has been called the floating brain. And it's an interaction with the brain up in our heads. Now, Women, for example, with breast cancer who don't know how to express anger, they've been shown to have diminished activity of a group of immune cells called natural killer cells. Natural killer cells attack foreign bacteria, uh, virus, and also malignant cells. In other words, they protect our boundaries. Women who don't know how to express their boundaries emotionally, they suppress their boundaries immunologically, and therefore they're more likely to develop disease. The same is true, of course, of men. So that the immune system is in constant interaction with our emotional responses. In another study with the immune system, medical students under the stress of examination were found to have diminished activity of their natural killer cells, these immune cells. But those students who were emotionally isolated were most likely to have diminished activity of the immune system. In other words, another fact that's important is our relationship with other people. And the Los Angeles uh, UCLA psychiatrist, Dr. Daniel Siegel, has coined the phrase interpersonal neurobiology to indicate that our biology of our brains, but indeed of our whole bodies, is an interaction with our personal relationships. So how we express ourselves in those relationships, or how we suppress ourselves, has a lot to do with our health. You talk particularly about autoimmune diseases and their connection, uh, well, that mind-body connection, like, for example, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, a case example I give in the book is a young woman who was preparing Rosh Hashanah dinner uh, one night for the family, Rosh Hashanah being the Jewish New Year that falls in September. Her, I called her Rachel in the book, and she was working very hard. She was at her mother's place cooking dinner, and she was in a real hurry because she had to finish by 5 o'clock when her brother was going to arrive with his family, and he didn't like her. He didn't want her to be at the dinner, so she had to finish the dinner and leave before he arrived. And I asked her, are you serious? You're making dinner for a family that you're only going to take part in yourself? Why? And she said, well, because the family should be together for Rosh Hashanah, shouldn't they? Well, she never finished the meal. Her body said no. She came down with severe inflammation on all her joints, and she was rushed to hospital with her first uh, malignant outbreak of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And that self-suppression is typical for people that develop rheumatoid arthritis. It's also typical for people that develop ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. I talk about the example of Lou Gehrig, if I may tell you about that. Lou Gehrig uh, was a great baseball player, a teammate of uh, Babe Ruth and the New York Yankees, and he set a record for consecutive games played that stood for nearly 60 years. Now, Gehrig wasn't just a great athlete. He was also beautiful. He, it's not that he was never hurt. At one point, his hands were x-rayed. It turns out his fingers had been fractured 17 separate times. And his teammates described him as grimacing like a maddened monkey in agony when he fielded the ball. But he never took himself out of a game because he was too dutiful to his own self-image and also to the fans and to the owners. Now, that sense of responsibility 
and, and not looking after yourself is totally typical of everybody who develops ALS. And it goes back to their childhoods because just like with the woman with rheumatoid arthritis, she was a failure the moment she was born because her mother conceived her to keep the marriage together with the father. The marriage broke up and she never had the feeling that she was accepted and liked for who she was. Therefore, she had to become this dutiful caregiver. Lou Gehrig's father was an alcoholic and Gehrig learned very early in life that he had to take care of others as the children of alcoholics often do and that then became his pattern until he could no longer drag himself around the baseball diamond because of the ALS which in North America, of course, is known as Lou Gehrig's disease. We're talking to Dr. Gabor Mate, the author of four best-selling books.